Welcome to week two of OILS 515 Introduction to Spatial Data Management. This week focusing on an introduction to vector data, particularly as background for the reading and work that you're going to start doing in looking at a variety of data products that may be relevant to your field and preparing to actually acquire and work with some data sets that you can find that would be useful in your research. So as we think about vector data, there are four topics we're going to cover today. First, the common geometry types that you're likely to encounter when working with vector data. We're going to discuss the concept of attributes as they are attached to features within vector data sets. We're going to actually view an example of an attribute table and think about the structure of attribute tables as it relates to database specifications as we'll work on later in the course. And finally, we're going to think about a linkage between essentially tabular data that you may already have and a conceptual model for linking those tabular data into a vector data model. So as we're talking about vector data, those data are often referred to in terms of features, where those features are defined in terms of geometries that are defined by one or more two or three dimensional points that are connected to each other in some way if there are more than, more than one and attributes that are associated with those geometries. So ge features basically consist of ge geometries of nodes linked to each other and their associated attributes. The three primary types of features that you're going to encounter in most situations include points, which as you might expect, are single XY or XYZ locations if we're talking about three-dimensional information where the locations are defined with an X, a Y, and Z in a particular coordinate reference system and then there may be one or more attributes attached to each of those locations defined by a point. Examples of point features might include a well that you're measuring water quality for or the level of groundwater, the locations of hospitals within a city, the street addresses or I should say the XY coordinates derived from street addresses of survey respondents or any other number of attributes or pieces of information that you can link to a specific point on the planet. The next type of feature you're likely to encounter consists of lines where those lines are defined by one or more points, I should say two or more points, where those points are connected to each other by line segments, producing a feature that consists of nodes along the line and then the line itself defined by the connecting um, segments between those points. You could think of line features as potentially being a road network or a trail network, perhaps the route defined by a stream or river, um, perhaps a geologic fault. Any of those features on the landscape or in the world that can be represented by a combination of points and line segments that connect those points. And again, then thinking about a set of attributes that are linked at this, at this time to the entire feature consisting of the points and line, connecting line segments. Finally, you're going to encounter polygons, 
which like lines consist of points and connecting line segments, but unlike lines are actually closed objects. So the first and last point defining the shape of a polygon are the same. So polygons typically define bounded regions. And examples of polygons might be political boundaries, such as counties or states or national boundaries. They may represent regions of somewhat homogeneous environmental conditions like vegetation or soils. They might represent um, other collections of similar regions or bounded areas like oceans or lakes. Basically, in any instance where you're wanting to represent an area and attach a set of attributes to those areas, you will be looking at a polygon data model or feature type for capturing that information. There are some composite feature types that include, say, um, multiple polygons in the definition of a feature where you might have a bounding polygon and then smaller polygons within that that essentially define excluded areas within that region. Um, you might have uh, collections of other features that are somehow aggregated into composite features depending on the particular system you're using or the data models that are being used. But the basic raw material that we're working with when we're talking about vector data are points, lines, and polygons and their associated attributes. When we're talking about feature attributes, what we're doing is we're, we're talking about the structured information or data that is linked to those geometries. And when we're talking about the attributes that are connected to those geometries, those values are typically defined in terms of specific data types, which are often in terms of actual database data types. So instead of everything just, for example, being a text string or unstructured uh, data, instead, as we will see when we start developing databases, when you are defining the table structure for a database or the content of a database, you are typically specifying the type of data that is going to go into a given field or attribute. The same concept applies when we're talking about feature attributes. So when you are looking at the attributes associated with a given feature in, say, a geographic information system or in another system that can analyze those features, you're going to typically have attributes that are defined using standard data types, such as text strings. So you might represent say the na last names of respondents in a survey or their street address, their street name as a text string. Um, you might also record their zip code as a text string since that's actually a more appropriate data type for something like a zip code in spite of the fact that it looks like it's numeric. You will often also encounter integers which are essentially non-decimal numbers. And that is a frequently used data type for specifying the way the data are going to be stored internally and also for checking to see whether or not data that are entered match the uh, expected format and content for a particular data, data type. So for example, if you enter a decimal number into an attribute field that is defined as an integer that may result in one of two results. One, it will generate an error and you will not be allowed to enter that information. Or two, it may quietly fail to add that decimal information into the attribute. Either one of those outcomes is not necessarily desirable. Another commonly encountered data type that you may have for some data that you're working with 
is floating point, where the precision of that floating point number is often defined as a part of the specification. But these are essentially numbers that can accommodate any number of decimal points or, or numbers following the decimal point as a part of the definition of the content that is going into a field. Also, date and date time content is often specifically defined as dates and timestamps have particular characteristics that if they are defined as those types of data, you can take advantage of knowledge that those are dates or date and timestamps to be able to do processing or analysis, say calculating the number of days or hours or other um, types of time between two different uh, date values, um, being able to translate them into other representations of date and time, um, so that's another type of attribute that you will often find defined in the structure of a geospatial uh, database or the attributes attached to features in a vector data set. Given this, it's not surprising that the attributes of a vector data set are frequently viewed and interacted with as tabular data. As is illustrated here, as a sample attribute table for, in this case, a data set of values collected from a Snowtel meteorological station in the area around Santa Fe for the month of August 2013, where you can see that there are a number of types of data that are represented in this data set. You can see that the first column, the site ID column, has numeric identifiers in it, um, though in this case, those uh, may actually be stored as text identifiers. You can see that we have a date and time column representing the time of observation for the measurements that are associated with this data set. And then we have actually four uh, other measurements that are associated with this particular station. Without the metadata or documentation associated with this data set, our understanding of what the content of these fields is fairly low. And so that's one of the reasons why later in the semester we will be talking at some great length about documentation or metadata associated with data sets that you are both accessing and data sets that you are producing. But for right now, this is an illustration of what an attribute table that may be associated with a set of features might look like. Finally, we can start thinking about the other direction of linkage, where perhaps you have tabular data that you have collected or that other, others have collected that you would like to use in some sort of spatial analysis or spatial management system. The concept of tabular data actually aligns fairly well with our conception um, of tabular data and being able to map those into a vector data type. We have a number of strategies or methods that we can use to transform tabular data into vector data. And those fall into three primary categories, though there are others that can be used. Those categories including geocoding, a commonly used process of converting street addresses into corresponding X and Y coordinates. So there are a large number of databases out there that represent road networks and their corresponding street addresses. And there are software tools that will attempt to locate a given street address along a road network and translate the location of that street address on that network into a corresponding XY location. If an XY location can be determined for that street address, it can be converted into a point 
feature class or collection of features where the attributes that may be associated with those addresses, say survey responses, can be then re-represented as a vector data set consisting of the XY points derived from those street addresses. Another strategy that can be used for converting your tabular data into vector data is one of doing place name matching, where you may have a data set that has the names of locations, perhaps county or state or even zip codes. And you may have a separate data set that has corresponding geometries. So you might actually have a geospatial file that represents the boundaries of those counties or states or zip codes. And you can use data, database manipulation tools, as we will work with in a few weeks, to actually join the attributes that are represented by your table with the geometries that may have originated elsewhere. So through being able to use those commonly shared place names, you can actually link attributes that you have in a table to geometries or XY locations that are in another or provided by another data source. Finally, you may actually be able to convert locations that are encoded into tables into geospatial data. So there are a number of common functions for being able to take, for example, latitude and longitude that might be included in a table of data as values in different columns and being able to convert those into a representation of a point geometry and linking that geometry to the rest of the columns in that table. Essentially creating a geospatial data set from what was previously a table that contained the bits of information needed to represent the XY location of those data values. So these are some common strategies you can use for essentially transforming tabular data into vector data sets. So even if you do not have inherently spatial data to begin with, you can start thinking about how you may be able to convert the tabular data that you do have into data that you can use in spatial analysis or in spatial modeling systems. This has just been a high level overview introducing some of the core concepts and terms that you will encounter in your reading and experimentation with data sets over the coming weeks. I hope it has clarified some of the aspects of vector data that you will be working with as we move through the course.